Gonna lift up this song. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life. And I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life. And all throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring in every season from where I'm standing. And help me remember when I'm weak. Fear may come, but fear will leave. And you lead my heart to victory. You are my strength and you always will be. I see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless, and all my sin rolled away because of you, O oh Jesus. So why should I fear? The evidence is here. Why should I fear? Amen. And all throughout my history, your faithfulness walk beside me the winter storms made way for spring in every season from where I'm standing and I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life all over my life See the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. I see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. Goodness all over my life, all 
never fail. I will never leave you nor forsake you. All over my life. All over my life. Every promise. All over my life. goodness of God. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head and I will sing of the goodness of God. church. Amen. God bless you. If you take your seats this evening, welcome to Archbishop Frimpong who's joined us tonight. Let's give the Lord a cup for his life as well. 
and for all of us here. It's, it's good to be here once again to prepare our hearts in a time of worship and then to hear the word go out as we, that's our desire. That's why we've come tonight to hear another word, to be encouraged, to pick up keys, to open doors within our lives so that God can truly bless us. But and not just us individually, but us together as one church, as one body. So just, just want to hand this time over to him as we take our offering. Pastor Randy will come and put the basket at the front and we'll come up row by row. And the details will be on the screen for you as well. So be blessed as you give this evening. What an awesome God we worship. What a mighty God we serve. Every knee will bow before Him. And every tongue confess that He is Lord. What an awesome God. What a mighty God we serve every knee, every knee will bow before Him, and every tongue confess that He is Lord. Oh yes, He is Alpha, Alpha. senior pastor to share this evening. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for tonight, Lord God. Thank you that you called us, Lord God, into your house once again. Father God, thank you that we are here, Lord God. Thank you that there's no better place that we could be tonight, Lord God, than to be here. Sit at your, your feet, Lord God, and to hear your word once again, Lord God. We just ask, Lord, for, for clear minds, Lord God, open hearts, Lord God, to receive your word this evening, Lord God. That, Father God, it will be sweetness to, to our soul, Lord God. We just want to thank you, Lord God. Thank you for the, for the, the children of this ministry, Lord God, that you've Bless us with such beautiful children, Lord God. We just pray that you just continue to inspire us, Lord God, to help them grow, Lord God, in your ways, Lord God. Just cover and bless every single one from the oldest to the youngest, Lord God. And for the offering that we've been able to give this evening, Father God, you know, Lord, where it's needed, Lord God. Just give us the wisdom, Lord God, how to use it wisely, Lord God, to do your will and your work, Lord God. And we do want to be mindful of our Archbishop, Lord God, wherever he is tonight, Lord God, that you will be with him, Lord God, that you will cover him, you will protect him, Lord God. And that, Father God, you will put a, a, a word in his heart ready for us on Sunday morning, Lord God. And right now, we just want to thank you for our senior pastor, Lord God, that she's about to share this evening, Lord God. May, may you go before her, Lord God. May your word fill her mouth, Lord God, that as she speaks, God, truly your word will be truly deposited within our hearts, even, Lord God. Cover and bless her, Lord God, and her family tonight as she shares. That Father God, Abraham's blessings will be hers tonight, Lord God, and will be ours also, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. As we say, let's go for a mighty amen. Amen, amen, amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you, church. Let's be open in the spirit. If you're here for the first time, you are truly, truly welcome. This is the house of God, and we are a gathering of believers. And we believe that God is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
That's why we are here. We want to forget everything that lies behind. Forget everything that we have done thus far. And let tonight be a new beginning and a new day that we can seek him while he may be found. I want us to just be open in our spirit and be able to draw close to God that he may draw close to us. This evening I'm going to be speaking about spiritual warfare. I'm going to be speaking about a little bit touching upon the works of the enemy. For for this reason Jesus has come. Jesus was manifested into this world that he may destroy the works of the enemy. And if you don't know it by now that we have an enemy, then you know it now. God exists. God is a supreme, awesome God. But we know that there's an enemy, the devil, Satan. In fact, we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And everything that God does, we know that the enemy wants to replicate and imitate. So there's three. There's Satan. There's the false prophet and the beast. So we need to understand and not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. These are scriptures that you know very well if you're a believer and you've studied the word of God, you've sat at his feet. But sometimes when we think we know something, it doesn't always follow that we are actually living what we know. And recently, I've I've begun to to read different translations. We hold, most of us hold, the New King James. And it's a fantastic translation, the most accurate, perhaps, or one of. But often, when we read the New King James, and that's our familiar scriptures, often they go above our head. We become so familiar with them that we're not receiving them. So I'd encourage you to look at other translations as well because there may be new words that are shared and it actually grips your spirit again. We can become sermon-proofed. I shared this many, many years that when we attend church and Bible study, we become familiar and habitual and religious. But God wants to do something new in our lives continually. I was listening to a minister this week, and his ministry, I was sharing it with our group last night. We had our last group session. Sad, actually. We're going to miss you guys. But we had our our last group session, and I was sharing it with them. I've been listening to this minister, and he actually has a deliverance ministry. He deals a lot with the supernatural realm. And for many years, he would be performing exorcisms again and again. He was actually, his ministry began um, by working with addictions and those that um, struggle in in that field. And so he used to see a lot of demonic possession. And he, for many, many years, would pray over people and actually perform exorcisms. He goes into some detail and you realize the reality and the fierceness of the spiritual realm and how many go that way because we shouldn't be surprised that we are drawn to the spiritual realm. We are created as spiritual beings and we share a humanity. So we are drawn to the spiritual to the spirit realm, and many go down that way. And he was performing exorcism after exorcism, and he was seeing demonic activity manifesting in front of him. But God spoke to him and said, to, and, and it was happening, and he was successful in the name of Jesus. In fact, many a time the demons would manifest. There was one particular young lady and she came, and she had a lot of piercings and, and um, things around her neck. And he, he particularly, his, it caught his attention. There was like a little fairy around her neck. And somehow, he was fixated upon that little trinket. And God was saying to him, that needs to go. And he was saying to get rid of your piercings, get rid of all of these different things that she was wearing. Anyway, she didn't. He prayed for her. She went away. She came back worse. And again, she, her friend was, was bringing her back and asking for prayer. He began to pray for her that evening. And they managed to take this little necklace off her. He turned his back and he, he got some sort of a, a hammer. And every time he went to, to, to bang it and break it, the demon in this young lady was screeching and crying and shouting until he destroyed it. 
But what that demon said is that we're going to kill. And he said, you can't touch us. We're believers. We believe in the name of Jesus Christ. He goes, not you, her. So these are fierce entities that we wrestle with. And I don't want to scare anyone, but that's a reality. That's why Jesus came into this world to destroy the works of the devil. I want to begin, but this is what actually what um, God actually said to him. So after many years of praying, exorcism after exorcism, God actually said, you know, the reality is, is that when we draw near to God, the scripture that he gave him, draw near to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's all in our hands. If you are a believer, you can never be possessed. If you have Jesus Christ living in your heart, the way, the truth, and the life, you can never be possessed. In fact, Satan can do nothing to you in the physical realm unless he has permission from God. The same way when he tested Job, he needed permission from God to touch a hair on his head. And often, we give the enemy too much credit. We may trip over and we may say superstitious thinking that we picked up along the way that the devil did that. Always remember that Satan is not God. He's not omnipresent. God is omnipresent. He fills all things and he's in every place at once. There's only one of Satan. He's a created being. If anything, he sends his, his, um, his officers, if you like, the principalities, the rulers of darkness. But often we give too much credit. We trip up and we think Satan's done it. No, we just wasn't looking where we were going. We break a bone, we can't come to church. We think Satan's like, no. We have an accident, it's a mistake. Often it's a human mistake. But we mustn't be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. This is what we want to look at tonight. So he often plays tricks with us. The minute you begin to give him too much credit, what you are doing is that you're actually doubting God, the power of God to keep you, to save you, to protect you. When he cannot do anything to you unless you give it over. So that's what I want to encourage us tonight. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He's given us weapons for warfare. And we are in a warfare. In Ephesians 6, 12. Spiritual warfare consists of struggling against these forces in our minds. We know that the battlefield is not out there. It's not in our spirit. It's in our mind. You know, he is the one that put the desire into Judas at the Last Supper, it speaks clearly that he can put thoughts into our mind. He cannot read our mind, only God can, but he can throw darts. I don't know the mystery behind how he does this, but I know through the scripture that he can place thoughts in our mind and desires in our heart. Sometimes he puts a desire in our heart, then he follows it up with a thought in our mind to validate the desire in our heart. And then we act upon it and it becomes sin. Other times he places the desire in our hearts or the, the thought in our mind, we conceive it, we meditate upon it, we embrace it, it becomes a desire and then we act upon it and it becomes sin. So why am I speaking like this tonight? Because God has given me lessons and, and tools to overcome this. Draw close to God. Resist him. Resist the temptations. Look, he stood before Jesus himself, the master himself, and tried to test, tempt him and test him. After Jesus was in the wilderness, you know these scriptures. And he was hungry. So don't be surprised when you're going through hunger, whether it be hunger for whatever it might be that you are hungering after. 
when you feel empty, don't be surprised when he comes and places thoughts into your mind. If you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread. But how did Jesus respond? With weapons of warfare. He was God incarnate and yet still he referred to the written word that we have. Why? Because he overcame not as God, but as God-man. He overcame in his humanity to show us that there is a way that we can overcome. Because if he overcame in his divinity, we are hopeless and helpless. He didn't just say anything from himself. He said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What do you think is happening to our youth, to this generation? He is waging war against them. The suicide rate in young people is through the roof. But he tried to do, tempt Jesus in the very same way. We just don't see it in that way. He said he took him to the highest pinnacle. And he said, throw yourself down. Was that not a spirit of suicide? And he actually used a scripture to validate the thought, he said to him, the, he'll give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. He even tried to tempt the master to be a Satan worshiper. If you bow down and worship me, these are thoughts. It may, we may be detached because we think it's a conversation, but he tries to have conversations with us day in and day out. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, there's a battle in the spiritual realm. We need to draw near to God and resist him. And God's been speaking a lot to me about little things because this minister, when he, he is active in deliverance, God's shown him so many things why people actually become possessed. And often it starts with a little foothold, a little, a little leaven as we know leavens the whole lump. It may begin with a desire, whether it be lust or whether it be greed or whether it be gossip or unforgiveness. In fact, unforgiveness is an open door to demonic presence. I want us to be able to forgive. And I was sharing with the group last night, forgiveness is not a one-time event. I forgive you. It's a daily forgiveness. I forgive you, I forgive, and other things may come to your mind. It may be genuinely from the hurt within you, but it also may be the enemy because we know he can plant seeds within us. Draw near to God. Resist him. Resist that thought. Abort that thought. But you can't just resist without replacing. It's almost a replacement of your thoughts. So 6.12. For, our, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God in bringing down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being to the obedience of Christ and having and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So who are these principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that Paul mentioned? In Ephesians, again, 6.12, we know that they're members of Satan's kingdom. 
And as I said, remember that he's a created being. He can only be in one place at one time. But he's got a vast army of demon spirits. So think about it. We need to be aware and we need to be guarded. Because the scripture says that he roams like a roaring lion and he's seeking. He's looking for those that are hungry. Because the scripture says to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. So when you are not filled with the word of God and your cup isn't running over, something that looks bitter and is actually garbage and damaging, you will be drawn to. Because that's what he thought about Jesus. He knew that after 40 days he would have been hungry. But praise be to God that Jesus had a communication with his father at all times. It's the word of God that will strengthen us. We need to put the full armor of God on and use the offensive weapon, which is the word of God. And in Matthew 6.25... Satan has nothing to do with when things go wrong in our lives. Remember that. He has nothing to do. He will try, but it's us that give it over. He causes us to think that he has that type of power over us, and it causes us to doubt God's promises, and then... He takes over us and takes over our situation and our circumstances. But when you lift up the shield of faith and you declare that, what Janet was saying earlier, you declare that he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world, that I am going to just sit at his feet. There is nothing the enemy can do. Don't give it over to him. Do not confess the negative. Confess the promises of God over your life. Because it becomes a self-fulfilled prophecy. Stop voicing what you fear. The enemy does not know what you fear until you voice it. That's why I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you, I'm going to read from another translation, but that's the, trans, the scripture, Matthew 6, 25. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And Hebrews 13, 5, your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied, be satisfied with what you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And sometimes the enemy places thoughts in our mind about financial lack or no opportunities or closed doors. And we meditate upon it. We receive it. And what do we do? We're forgetting that God says, I will never leave you and I will never provide you. And when God makes man rich, he adds no sorrow to it. But when we try and do things in our own ability, we become exhausted, we become bankrupt, we become disheartened and discouraged. Why? Because we've listened to the lie of the enemy that somehow God will abandon us. But he says, even if your mother and your father abandoned you, I will never. 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Satan has no authority to attack the believer in the natural or external world. He definitely needs God's permission. And if God gives him permission to touch you, Archbishop has shared it so many times, is to show you that and, and the enemy how strong you are. It's about us growing deep roots. Do not be concerned with how you look or the situation or circumstances around your life for now. What you need to be concerned about is are you eating the word? Are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Do you desire to draw close to God? And if you don't, 
I encourage you, begin to eat slowly. Because the less you read, the less, the, the less you will want to read. You have to begin somewhere, church, like a baby that is weaned. When a baby comes off milk, the mother weans it slowly until it begins to delight in the food, the textures, and what is offered. And that's what we need to do. Because we become very weak when you don't read the word of God. And then when the lies of the enemy comes, you have nothing. You don't have weapons of warfare deposited in your spirit. So you can draw the sword of the word of God. If you don't know the word, how are you going to execute it? It's because Jesus knew to draw from Deuteronomy, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. He knew it is written. And we need to also, don't chase wrong things. I was looking at the life of Samson and how the enemy overtook him. One of the most powerful men in the scripture. And his end was so sad, so tragic. But how did the enemy overtake him? He's an opportunist. He does not ring the bell once, and if you don't open, he goes. He rings again and again and again. He's a thief and a liar from the beginning, and he takes that from his own resources. So you need to resist him. How? Again and again and again. And as I said, Things within our own hearts, desires from our sinful nature are like a welcome mat for Satan. If there's unforgiveness, we need to forgive. If we are, there's, there's so many things that are going on in the spiritual realm. The music that the youth listen to and even ourselves the frequencies and the vibrations are open doors for Satan. The Ouija boards, the occult, it's like a welcome mat for the spiritual realm. But our God is so much greater, so much better, has so much in store for us. He wants to love us and he loves us with a ferocious love. This enemy is defeated. We know how the story ends and we have a home in glory. I was looking at the throne room of God, where this supernatural being, the God that we serve, the one who's high and lofty, who lives in unapproachable light, the ancient of days, with the bronze and the eyes of fire. He lives in a place created in a throne room with the 24 elders around him and the angelic beings. This is the God that we serve, this is the God that we present. This is the God that we desire to live with for all eternity. But until we get there, there's a battle that's raging. And as time goes on, you can see it more evidently. Satan used to hide himself, as we know. 30 years ago when we first believed, we were amazed at the back masking, at the music that had a hidden message and a hidden code. Nothing is hidden. And yet people are flocking and worshipping him. Because that's been his desire from the beginning. He was a cherub, Lucifer, son of the morning. He conducted the orchestras of heaven. The rhythms and the beats and the worship. But when Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning, and he fell and drew a third of the angelic beings with him, and they became demons, principalities, and rulers of darkness and wickedness in heavenly places, the prince of the power of the air, there's warfare, church. And we need to stand. And having done all, we will stand. But we don't play church. We are the church. When Moses ascended the mount to receive the commandments from God, to speak with the Almighty face to face, his brother Aaron, who was the religious leader, was at the foot of the mountain with the Israelites, and they were playing church. They were dancing around the foot of the mountain. Moses delayed 
Like Jesus perhaps is delaying. We are waiting for the coming of our Messiah again. But perhaps it feels like he's delaying. And much of the church is playing and singing and sinning. And because he delayed Moses, Aaron, who was the priest, the high priest, took the earrings and the jewelry of the people and they made the golden calf. Because why? As we began, we have a need. We were created to worship. We were created supernatural beings and they needed to worship. And because they took their eyes off God, they worshiped the creation. They worshiped something that they made with their own hands. What's changed? Do we not worship silver and gold, material wealth? Do we not worship things that are carnal, that our eyes see? That's why worship belongs to the unseen. Anything visible is passing away. You can use it. You can enjoy it if you guard your heart. But worshiping it is the problem. And it's so subtle. And Samson chased the wrong things. He broke the rules. He was thinking that everything was under control. That again, somehow the anointing would come upon him when he needed it at the last moment. But there came a time where he thought when the Philistines came upon him that he was going to rise again and overcome them like he did before. But the anointing was not there. That Psalm 51 Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and restore a steadfast spirit within me. And please, take not your Holy Spirit from me. That's the promise. The Holy Spirit is the promise, the comforter, the keeper, who is given to the believer. Church, you are privileged and blessed. When you are a child of the living God, not everybody's a child of God. You have to believe. You have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Where? Until salvation. And then you will be saved. And then you will become children of God. And if you are a child of God, all the promises in the scripture are yours. Yes and amen. And more than that, Jesus comes and clothes us and covers us and accepts us so that the Father is well pleased with us. The devil wants to establish strongholds. And this is something else that I've been looking at, strongholds. And strongholds are actually thoughts and imaginations in our mind. Many of us have different strongholds. It starts with a thought. This minister actually explained it, imagination, and he explained it, he broke the word up, just a play on words, but it's a nation of images. That imagination is a nation, an an array, a vastness of images in our mind. And when we look upon those images again and again, because again, because of our sinful nature, the enemy knows what 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 he can trip us up on. They become a stronghold. So a stronghold, I'll read it, is anything that exalts itself in our minds, pretending to be bigger or more powerful than God. And the New American Standard Version calls them fortresses. And they're built by our imaginations. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, when you meditate upon that high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, if you meditate upon it, it becomes a stronghold. And we need to dismantle those strongholds. And if we try and ignore them, we'll never be able to live that life of true victory promised by Jesus. John 10.10 says, A thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come, Jesus said, so that they, that's us, may have life and have it in abundance. But the devil's chief target is our mind. Because the most effective way to influence our behavior is how? It's to influence our thinking. 
As a man thinketh, the scripture says, so he is. So that's why we know that the battlefield is in our mind. And he did it exactly the same to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, 2 to 5. Are you still with me? I'm going to be finishing shortly. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said, no, you will not die. Which one? Then the serpent said to the woman, you will, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Stab. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave to her husband. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings. <sighs> Hallelujah. See how Satan takes a truth but twists it with a lie very subtly. And then if we receive it, that's why continually, please, church, Determine this year, this is the beginning of this year, to read your scriptures, to read your Bible. You know, the greatest hiding place for depression and anxiety and fear, the greatest hiding place is actually happiness. But how do we get that joy? By reading our word, by focusing on the promises of God. The greatest hiding place for depression is joy. Hide in the joy of the Lord. That is our strength. And start rebuking the voices of the enemy. I want to read. I've shared about Let me read it from Matthew 4, 1. If he tempted Jesus himself, and this is a different translation. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But he answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took, see, the tempter is the devil. We know that, but that's how, that's who he is. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. How many young men has he been saying these lies to? Throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you that they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus told him, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. And that's from Deuteronomy. Again, the devil took him. See what an opportunity he is. You'd have thought that he would have fleed, but again and again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. We sung a song earlier. We were practicing it. Beautiful song, better. Better than all these things. All the money that this world could hold. Uh, mountains made of solid gold. Better than all these things. Who compares to Jesus? And yet he thought that he was going to tempt Jesus. To a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go, well, this is, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and immediately angels came and began to serve him. So our counterattack, six, Ephesians 6.13 this is why we have to be dressed in the full armor of God if we're able to resist in that evil day. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, 
having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Lift up your faith. It is impossible. It says faith is the substance hoped for, the evidence not seen. So it is impossible to please God without faith. So lift up faith. Taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts. Don't know how he does it, but there's some fiery darts that come against us. Darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And that's the only, the only piece of armor in, that, in those weapons that's offensive is the sword of the spirit. You know, I was reading about the different wars now that are surrounding Jerusalem. And the wars that we've been through, um, even the war when it was, um, when it was President Bush as, um, in office, and it was the Iraq war. And he actually said, and it's written, and obviously there's documents, um, the beginning of the Iraq war where President Bush wanted to attack. And he wanted to attack with, it's called shock and awe, which is a military doctrine now that they have based on the use of using overwhelming power, like spectacular displays of force to paralyze the enemy's perception and stop them. And that's what we need to do. Shock and awe and use overwhelming power of the word of God to stop the enemy in, their, in, his, in his tracks. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6, and we're going to begin to conclude. For though we walk, meaning though we live in the flesh, we're not carrying on our warfare according to the flesh and using mere human weapons. For the weapons of our warfare aren't physical, meaning they are not flesh and blood, but they're mighty in God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we must lead every thought and purpose away captive to the obedience of Christ. And being in readiness, we need to punish every disobedience when your own submission and obedience are fully secured and complete. So to win this war against Satan, we need to take control of our thought life. Take every thought captive. And we take those, cap those thoughts captives by addressing them through the word of God. And I'm going to go through some scriptures now. Just going to give you some scriptures. And this is the weapons of our warfare. John 8, 32. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And these are strongholds. Anger is a stronghold. So, so if you have anger as a stronghold, you counter that anger with the weapon of your warfare by going through the scriptures and finding the corresponding scripture like Jesus did. When he was tempted, turn this stone into bread, he went into his, art, his, his spirit, let's say. He knew his scripture and he said, he found it. Man shall not live by bread alone. So he countered the attack. That's how you wage warfare against a spiritual being, by the word of God. So anger, Psalm 37, 8, stop being angry, turn from your rage, do not lose your temper, it only leads to harm. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, do not fret, it only causes harm. Proverbs 1429, bear with me, I want these scriptures to resonate and to cut through the spiritual atmosphere and climate, and we're going to conclude. If the worship team can come up. So Proverbs 1429, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. So when you feel something's triggered and you feel angry, have these scriptures at hand. Meditate upon them. Whatever your stronghold is, if it's fear, then in your, in your toolbox, if you like, 
You are going to know four or five scriptures. You feel fear rise. You counter it by God has not given us a spirit of fear. You're speaking to an enemy like Jesus did. Proverbs, people, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Ephesians 4.26, be angry and do not sin. You feel anger rising? Immediately, be angry and do not sin. And it carries on and on, loads of scriptures that you can actually have. Fear, even in Psalm 23, 4. Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let's stand together. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Fear. Psalm 27, 10 says, even if my father and my mother, if you feel abandoned, if you feel forsaken, if you feel lonely and alone, if you're going through a breakup, have these scriptures. Even if my father and my mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Deuteronomy 31, 6. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he's the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So many. Shame. If you feel that you've sinned in any way, come to Jesus. His blood is still cleansing, forgiving, and restoring. Isaiah 57 says, Isaiah 50 verse 7 For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. So when the devil comes and continually brings that and establishes that stronghold of shame, have these scriptures, though my sins were red as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Have these scriptures that I am accepted and I'm forgiven in the beloved. Have those scriptures for shame and despair, that I'm a new creation, old things have passed away. Behold, everything is new. You are answering him. You are drawing the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lying, Leviticus 19, 11. Do not steal, do not deceive or cheat one another. If you, there's a stronghold of lying because the devil is the father of lies. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And these are the works of our flesh. If you read Galatians, you can compare and contrast the works of the flesh and the works of God. And sometimes when we take our eyes off the mask, we can fall into the sins of this world. So when they do come, and they attack, and you've allowed it, again, don't stay down. How many of you, when you trip and you fall, you just stay down there for a few weeks? <laughs> you get up, don't you? Amen. And that's what we need to do. It doesn't matter how many mistakes we make. Determine and decide that God always wants the best for you. He's always beckoning you to come. It's the voice again, the thoughts that the enemy plants into your mind that condemn you. Because the scripture says when you feel condemned, answer it. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Answer him. The Lord did, and it goes on and on and on. Financial lack, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you. You could say, when you fear whatever it might be, a lack, you can respond. I know the plans that God has for me to give me a future and a hope. And Jesus himself said, do not worry about these things. Saying, what we will eat, what shall we drink, what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. You just seek the kingdom of God, and above all else, live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And Psalm 37, one of my favorites, 
Once I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or righteous forsaken and their children begging bread. His blessing will be upon us. Let's do the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you and your children's children. And Philippians 4.19, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Addictions, and it goes on and on. I'm encouraging you draw close to God, resist him, and draw close to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. God bless you, church. Victory, whatever you want. Amen. We'll do the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.
want to thank the, the Lord for the message for the senior pastor this evening. We're mindful of our Archbishop and, and his return on Sunday for all of our lives here, that we, we got here tonight, that we're able to hear the words. Thank the Lord for Archbishop Frimpong's life as well for joining us tonight as well. And just give us safe travel mercies as we make our way home this evening. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for tonight, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for what you've given us tonight, Lord God. Thank you for your word, Lord God, your powerful word that's gone out, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord, that we'll all take it, Lord God, and take the positive within our hearts, Lord God, and learn from it, Lord God, and, and, and try to live it, Father. Help us, Lord God, as we seek your face, Lord God, and, and as we look to you, Lord God. We just thank you, Lord God, for, for this beautiful time of worship that we've had, Lord God, for your word that's gone forth, Lord God, for all of us here, Lord God, for those that have tuned in last year, Lord God, that, Father God, we are one in you, Father. We just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for, as we going to make our way home, Lord God, that you give us travel mercy, Lord God, that we'll arrive safe, Lord God, and that we'll be able to return into your house again on Sunday, Lord God, with joy in our hearts, Lord God. We just want to thank you, Lord God, for all that you've given us, Lord God, and just thank you for what you're, what, what you're doing, what you have done, and what you're about to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's say the grace again this evening. May the grace of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forevermore, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow us through the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you.